So we've got a few folk in now, so I think I'm just going to get started. So welcome to this talk, uh, Beginner's Guide to Buying a Telescope. I'm Stephen McIntosh. Uh, the page I run is Highland Astronomy. And this is in collaboration with the Merkinch Nature Reserve. Uh, I work with Caroline Snow. We run the astronomy program here in Inverness. And I'd also like to thank Ghost Stargazing. And Neil reached out to collaborate with this talk which was great and I'm going to post a few links to their website later in the talk. So just a quick uh, synopsis of what I'll cover tonight. Um, now although it's about telescopes I'm a massive fan of binoculars and I think the two are interchangeable so I'm going to talk about binoculars first of all. We're then going to talk about portability I'm not going to get too technical, this is for beginners, so we'll talk a little bit about the aperture and magnification of telescopes and crucially about your environment, where are you doing your observing and how is that going to impact what you should buy and what you need. Then we'll talk about types of telescopes and I'm going to give you a few recommendations. If there's time I'd like to give you a little guide to, to December skies, but I don't want to talk for too long, uh, maybe aim for the talk to be about 45 minutes long with some questions at the end. So just to start off eh, I wanted to say welcome from the Highlands of Scotland. This is where I live. I feel very fortunate to live here. Um, I've got some pictures I've taken just to start off. This is mid-summer last year on the solstice. I was standing on the shores of Buncrew and it was 11 p.m. at night and we get these magical sunsets, very long and protracted up this far north. And we can't do an awful lot of stargazing at this time of the year, which is a bit of a bummer, but uh, we do get these really long summer days. Uh, so some of you might be tuning in from the Highlands, so hello. Um, and to those of you who are not, and maybe come from England or anywhere across the world, I would just encourage you, when it's safe, please come to the Highlands and enjoy the scenery and the stargazing. And one a thing that we're very privileged to have in the Highlands is very dark skies. Here's just a quick look at the light pollution survey for Scotland beyond the central belt. And this is where I live in Inverness, but you can see there are vast swathes of incredibly dark skies that you can access up here as a tourist so please come and visit we do get we do see the aurora more often than many people think this is a shot i took um, down at the shoreline close to inverness and we can see the northern lights uh, over towards the black isle and when you go out looking for it here you do find it in fact um last month i took an image from my house. This is me up in my attic room. I took a picture looking out uh, over the Bewley Firth and I could see the northern lights and there you see the green and reds of the aurora. Uh, that's from suburban Inverness, so quite amazing. But when it gets to winter time we get lovely dark skies and the Milky Way is something that uh, we're kind of very spoilt um, to have access to here so we don't need to go very far and we can see the amazing glow of the Milky Way this um, band of light that reminds us that we're embedded in a spiral galaxy I always find it one of the most incredible things to look at we don't need telescopes or binoculars to access this and uh, certainly that's a really good reason to come to dark places uh, like the Highlands This is another image. This is from the Western Isles. I was over at the Hebridean Dark Sky Festival last year. I was camping out in my van and I woke up early in the morning and took this lovely picture. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. You might see a faint smudge in the lower corner and of course the Milky Way overhead. And just a little bit about my work. Um, I run two astronomy programs up in the Highlands. This is Star Stories at Abriacan Forest. This is a community woodland and we do very family orientated events. Uh, stargazing, uh, we have a Burns event 
all sorts of things. We also have a ranger, Cleland, who does storytelling around the campfire. Fire. So hopefully you can imagine the atmosphere of these events are quite special. And we even built a wooden henge um, to uh, uh, try to uh, measure the seasons and the changing constellations. And that's run in coordination with STFC. And this talk has been brought to you by the Merkant Nature Reserve. And these are some of the events we run. This is the reserve. It's on the western tip of Inverness. It's quite um, light polluted, but there are some very good views if you head out to the point, And it's a really great place to come and do bird watching and things like that. And I'd like to shout out to Caroline, who I hope's in the stream, and she works with me on this project. Incidentally, those of you who have donated, um, thank you very much. And if you enjoy the talk, please um, consider se sending a small donation to the reserve and it will help the program going forward. And this is just some hotel work I do as well, and I also visit lots of festivals. So, enough about me, let's get into the talk. Now, um, well, I think one of the problems when we think about telescopes and astronomy, we um, fixate on the concept of having a big telescope and seeing um, galaxies and clusters and planets, and they're all very good. One of the problems is that the weather can get in the way. And this might be a typical view of the night sky in northern Europe. Even when it's clear, you get fronts coming in. And probably uh, the, the, the biggest nugget of wisdom you might take away from uh, this talk is this sentence, which says, the best telescope you'll own is the one you use most often. And the problem with changeable skies is if you just focus on a telescope, you'll go out, you'll get disappointed, you'll have to pack your telescope away. And that can be a problem to keep you energized and keep you in the hobby. So my number one recommendation from this talk, uh, although I will be recommending telescopes and talking about them in detail, is to buy a pair of binoculars. And especially if you have a limited budget, perhaps less than £100, I wouldn't waste that money on a telescope. I would instead buy some binoculars. In fact, it's the... Um, a device we use for all our outreach. So this is a Breakin, people looking at the moon. It empowers people in outreach. They've all got their own telescope, if you like, and it's just fantastic. And I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about what you can see in binoculars. So firstly, you get amazing views of the moon. You can actually access the moons of Jupiter, and you'll see them as pinpoints of light. Uh, which many people are surprised at, but just try having a look at Jupiter in a pair of binoculars. Uh, for star clusters like the Pleiades, they're excellent. You can see bright nebula like the Orion Nebula here in the belt of the constellation Orion. And comets are particularly well suited to binocular views. Now, this is Comet Neowise, which some of you may have attempted to see last summer. And this is actually a binocular view that I had obtained. I had uh, stuck my mobile phone to my binoculars, and that is exactly what I saw of the comet. Quite staggering in a simple handheld pair. And in galaxies as well, deep sky objects, here's the Andromeda galaxy. Now, some of you may recognize this collection of stars. This is the plough. It's not a constellation. It's an asterism. And it's part of Urza Major, the Greater Bear. Now, some of you may or may not know that there is a famous double star in the second star of the handle. Please look out for that. If you go out tonight or any night and you see the plough, if your eyesight is 20-20, you should be able to see that there are two stars here. But bring a pair of binoculars to bear on those stars and you will unmistakably see them as two. So again, we can look at double stars with binoculars. And the bigger the binoculars you buy, the more stars you can reach. So this is quite staggering, I think. If you were to go out to a dark sky environment, you might access about 3,000, 2,000 stars naked eye. Look at the 
amount of stars you can access with small binoculars. So a pair of 3 by 35s 450,000 stars. So that's two orders of magnitude greater than with your naked eye. Now this, these two numbers represent a, the magnification and the objective size. Now I want to show you that with an actual demo. Uh, I'm going to show you some binoculars just now if I can get this to work. So bear with me. And I'm going to switch on QuickTime. And you might see me now in my study. And let me increase this. Hopefully this is nice and clear. Hello. Um, I just wanted to show you the scale of these binoculars to help you um, understand just how versatile they are. So this is a pair of 50 by 10 binoculars. These are Olympus uh, DSP-1s, which I'm going to recommend later. Incidentally, I'm not affiliated with any of these manufacturers. These are just my own recommendations from use. Uh, they've got 50 millimeter objectives and they're 10 times magnification. And these are very, very good uh, for general use. You can see steady images. Um, as I was saying before, wonderful views of the moon with these. I can see star clusters. Um, I can see galaxies. Very versatile. If you wanted something a little bit smaller and a bit cheaper, you could drop down to these um, 40 millimeter by 8 magnification. Now lots of bird watchers use these. And in fact, this is the main binocular I use for outreach. Um, we've bought them for Abriakin and Merkinch, and people love using them. And I would maybe uh, lean towards the smaller pair because you'll get a wider field, and if you're a beginner, you'll find it easier to find things in the night sky. Also, if you have young children, they'll find these very, very easy to use. Now, you don't just have to use uh, handheld binoculars like this um, in your hands. You can move to a setup like this. Now hopefully you can see this. In fact, this is my standard setup um, and about 90% of the material I publish on Highland Astronomy I use this tripod mounted setup where I've got a pair of uh, 50 by 10s and I film by using one of these um, adapters that I attach to the back of the binocular and my phone can slip on the back. Now these are only about uh, 8 10 pound on Amazon and I might give you a link to those later. So very very versatile system, pair of binoculars on a tripod. Now if you want to get a bit more serious with binoculars you could step up to these. Now, these are Celestron Skymaster 100 by 25 uh, binoculars. Now they're absolutely huge. They're effectively two refracting telescopes stuck together. The views through them though are absolutely phenomenon, phenomenal. I can see the crescent of Venus. I can see its phase. I can discern that there's a ring system on Saturn. Um, the Andromeda galaxy looks stunning in these. The problem with them however is holding them. So you can hold these steady for about five seconds maximum and you'll get shaky um, stuttering views and to me that defeats the, po the whole point of binocular astronomy. So please don't make the mistake of buying massive binoculars without adequate mounting. So if you want to go into this uh, area you must get a steady mount and that's going to increase the price and therefore you're kind of getting into the territory of using telescopes anyway. So let's now talk about telescopes. So I'm just going to switch this video feed off and go back to my slides. And incidentally I cannot see your questions at the moment but I hope to take some at the end so sorry about that. Let's keep going. I'm just going to check the feed to make sure everyone can hear me. Maybe another sound check from everyone. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of comments. Hi everyone. Hi Tony. I haven't been able to catch up with all your 
uh, comments yet, but let's make some progress with the talk then. So having waxed lyrical about binoculars, what about telescopes? Why would we bother? Well, if you want views of a planet like this, close-in views, then binoculars are not going to serve you very well, and that's when we move into telescope territory. So here's a, a stunning image of um, Jupiter, where you can see the marble um, a cloud banding, you can see the storm. These are the sorts of views that telescopes give us. You get this feeling of being orb in orbit around the moon uh, sometimes when you look through a telescope at it. This is the incredible detail you can see um, on the craters and the shadowing. You can access hundreds of double stars, uh, really beautiful ones of different colours. And also deep sky objects really come to life in telescopes. So here is a globular cluster and obviously galaxies. You're going to see way more detail and structure in a galaxy through a telescope. So I've just got a couple of videos I was going to share with you of typical views I've got with my telescope. Um, now let me see. Yeah. Let me go first of all to some pictures of the moon. So this is video I shot of the moon. Hopefully that's clear enough. So look at that, absolutely incredible. And th these are the sorts of views you can access even with fairly inexpensive telescopes. You see the lunar maria here, the seas, the dark regions. You can even see the rebound peaks in the middle of craters and even some of the terracing that you get. So you can really start to look at the incredible geology of the moon with a telescope. Let me just move forward and make some more progress. I've got quite a few videos to show you here. Uh, now, if you look at the moon when it's full in a telescope, it looks totally different and you get different lighting. You can see the um, ejecta bands from craters. So if you imagine a rock hitting the moon here, it would have thrown huge amounts of material radially outwards and you can see that during full moon. So quite stunning and planetary views. Um, so again this is all from my telescope and I'm run, I've run. i run this through a video at the moment. This is Jupiter that I filmed a year or so ago. You can actually see the fact that it is not a sphere but it is, it's uh, elongated at the poles there and that's due to the, the rate of rotation. You can clearly see some of the banding on Jupiter as well. So quite amazing having access to these views. It's a little bit muffled, that not too much colouring there, but it depends when you go out. Uh, some nights you get brilliant um, views and others less so. And here is Saturn looking a bit smaller here, but, a, but still you can clearly see the rings. And again, this is all uh, real-time views through my telescope. Uh, quite staggering. I believe I was at Loch Ness side when I filmed this, I was looking along the length of Long Loch Ness and that's a great place for seeing this, the, the planet's transit in the south. And final one I will show you is Venus. So this is me in my back garden. I'll just pause this a second. Some of you may be seeing Venus in the morning at the moment. It's a lovely morning star. This was when it was an evening star. And that's typically a naked eye view of Venus. But I've got my telescope on it. So have a look and see what I can see through it. And look at that. Absolutely stunning. You can see the phase of Venus there. And you can actually determine that that has a thick atmosphere. You can see some diffusion of light along the um, terminator there. Quite amazing. So there's some videos. Um, so that's what you can see in telescopes. Now let me go back to presenting. So let's talk a little bit more technical now. So I don't want this to get too boring, but a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking about the magnification of a telescope. Now, I'm not going to talk about magnification at all because it's not really that important. The most important thing when buying a telescope is the size of the objective 
lens or the aperture. And essentially you want to get the biggest telescope that you can port and move around comfortably. And why does a big aperture matter? Well, this is a, a really good analogy, which is the light, uh, light bucket. Imagine you had two buckets and it was raining. The wider the bucket and the bigger its volume means you're going to collect more uh, water per unit time. And it's the same with photons of light as they emerge from space. So the bigger uh, the aperture of your telescope, the more vibrant and bright views you're going to see. Now, because the area is pi r squared, you might um, think that if you double the aperture, you just double the performance, but actually you're going to increase it by four times. So think about that, uh, pi r squared. If you double the objective area of your telescope, you're going to increase its light gathering power by fourfold. And that means that even if you can get slightly bigger aperture, it's going to have a big impact on what you can see. Now, it's difficult to illustrate in a talk about this. You have to look through eyepieces. But here's an example of what increasing aperture can do to something like a globular cluster. So here's a six inch telescope, which is very portable. Um, you still see lots of structure in the globular, but you move up to 10 inches and you start to see more uh, uh, individual stars. And if you get up to something like a 16 inch, which isn't really within the, within the scope of this talk or what you guys would be aiming to, to purchase, you start to see in incredible detail in it. So it's not to say this view isn't good because it is equally amazing. It's just that you're going to tease out more and more detail and brighter views if you increase the aperture. Here's another example um, of the Orion Nebula. And I should have had a, a, a transcript here, but this, I think, is a 6-inch versus a 12-inch. And you just see how much brighter and there's more detail there to see. Now, obviously, you don't want to go overboard. Uh, this is quite funny, actually. This is a guy called Mike Clement. I believe he has the record for the biggest um, um, hobbyist um, reflector. This is a Dobsonian that he built in his back garden. Uh, quite a big garden and the story is that he found the mirror on eBay it was an ex-US um, spy mirror on a satellite and the, it was faulty and he purchased it and he built this huge telescope so I'm not going to recommend this telescope incidentally but I'm sure the views are spectacular so this brings me on to a really important point and I don't hear this mentioned a lot when um, people talk about what telescope to buy and that's where you live and the, your mobility. So uh, this is a, 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 an interesting uh, way of thinking about it. Um, here's an analogy with chemistry, the activation energy that you need for an, a reaction. And I think about this uh, when we talk about getting out into the night sky. If you're sitting at home and it's cold and you're feeling a bit lazy, how much energy do you need to overcome to take your telescope out? And the factors that are going to influence that are how heavy it is, how long it's going to take to set up, and how complex it is. Now, if you begin and you've just got your first telescope, you're going to be highly motivated and energized, and you're going to overcome that activation barrier. But as the weeks and months go on, you might lose interest. You might find that this is insurmountable. And that's a real tragedy. And so what I want to encourage you to do is reduce this barrier. Maybe don't go for the biggest telescope or the most complex. Simplify things. And one of the best ways you can start to think about that is to consider where you actually live. So do you live in a rural environment like this um, where you can basically leave a telescope set up all day? Uh, then you don't need to worry about portability, so you might consider a very big telescope. Or perhaps you're in suburbia, um, kind of halfway house, where you've got a big garden. You can, you know, uh, lug a large telescope out of a shed, which isn't too arduous. But perhaps you live in a terraced environment where you don't have a lot of garden, or maybe you're living in, in flats where you're having to go downstairs. And... So many people fall into the trap of getting a telescope recommended to them that are, that's too big for these settings and they just give up. So think carefully about that before you buy a telescope. 
And these thought bubbles suggest, uh, you know, what you might want to look for. So large aperture here, maybe a medium aperture in suburbia. And if I was living in these environments, I'd be thinking about something small and portable that I could run down the stairs with, get in my car and go out and uh, access the night sky. Also think about light pollution. Um, even if you're in a rural environment, maybe there's lots of light pollution and you have to travel to get to dark skies. Again, you want to consider portability then. So I'm just going to quickly run through the three different types um, of telescope now. Um, starting with the classic refractor, this is the uh, a Galilean telescope, the one that most people are familiar with actually. You see them sometimes artfully placed in front of conservatories. Uh, people use them to look at uh, wildlife and nature, uh, but they're also serious astronomical instruments as well. Uh, now, what are the advantages of refractors? Well, they're easy to use. They produce upright images. So if you're someone that wants a telescope uh, that will also allow you to look at nature, um, then you definitely want to consider a refractor because the images are going to be um, the right way up. They're very good for the moon, uh, planets and some double stars and they're quite rugged so you can throw them around. Again, if you're that person up in the flat, you might want to lean towards a refractor because you could throw them in a bag and take them away quite easily. Disadvantages, um, if you want re a really good refractor, you pay loads of money they're a little bit less suited for deep sky and if you want a big aperture you're going to get into serious amounts of money um, so that's one thing to consider we then move on to the Newtonian reflector and it doesn't use lenses it uses a large mirror at the back and because of this these are cheap to manufacture and you can make quite large apertures for decent money what's the advantages well they're very good value they can accommodate very large apertures, as I'm going to show you. And they're quite a good all-rounder, actually. Um, you can access planets and deep sky objects. Disadvantages. They require a bit of maintenance. You need to collimate the mirrors occasionally, which is not very arduous, but you have to do it. And they're less robust as a result. So if you're someone that has to constantly go back and forward and lug uh, telescopes into the car, there may be... Uh, a little bit less um, useful, but uh, still, it doesn't take a lot to collimate a telescope. Um, you also can't use them really for looking at nature because the image is upside down and inverted and you would get very frustrated with them. That's what you wanted to do. And the final type I'm going to talk about are Cassegrains. This is the telescope I have. And these work by having two mirrors that effectively uh, almost double the length of the main tube so they're really good um, at saving space while allowing you to have a big aperture the main advantage with them is they're compact and they're also uh, quite good for astrophotography because they've got a long focal range and again they're a good all uh, all rounder good for deep sky and planets disadvantages they cost much more they do require collimation and they have a little bit of what's called secondary mirror obstruction. So this bit in the centre here can sometimes reduce the clarity of planets and things like that. Once you've thought about your type of telescope, you also need to seriously consider the mount. Now, this is really important. The number of people that have come to me um, uh, complaining that they can't use their telescope and it's too complicated and they have an equatorial mount. My advice is if you are starting out as a beginner do not go near an equatorial telescope to begin with unless you have someone that can help because they're a little bit more complicated, they're longer set up and there's just more hassle involved. I would steer towards an alt azimuth mount which is basically exactly the same as a, ca a camera tripod or those big binoculars you get at the seaside so you just look up down left and right and within this category is something called the Dobsonian mount which is very similar and easy to use so that's just an illustration of how these work 
So with the Alt Azimuth, easy to set up, intuitive, great for beginners. Whereas the Equatorial, trickier, however easier to track objects. And this is more your gateway, I would say, into more um, advanced um, um, uh, astronomy. So if you start to really get the bug, then I would start to look at an Equatorial mount at that stage. So I'm finally on to recommendations. Um, so again, I'm not affiliated with these companies, but these are the Olympus DSP ones I showed you earlier um, in my office. Uh, this is the price uh, last time I checked for the 10 by 50 or the 8 by 40s. Not much between them. And if you do want to get super serious with those big Sky Masters I told I, I showed you, they're quite a, a bit more. I wouldn't necessarily recommend these for beginners though but it's something to consider if you can buy a tripod on top of them. And finally for telescopes now. So here is my recommendation for the best um, beginner's telescope that will give you wonderful views of the night sky, will last you all, all your life if, if, if you look after them. And this is a 6 or 8 inch Dobsonian. Now I'm just singling out the Skyliner for no particular reason here. It's very popular within the UK. Uh, that's the price, 220 to 275 depending on if you buy the 6 or 8 inch. If it was this was for a, a, um, a, a child, I would err towards the 6 inch. They could probably comfortably park that in their bedroom. The 8 inch is a little bit bigger um, and probably if you're wanting to store it in a shed, that would be the size I would go for. Now, what if you want something super portable, you want to take it away in camping trips, then there's two, and Neil actually from Ghost Stargazing recommended this one here, the Skywatcher Heritage, um, and also the Orion Star Blast is the one I've seen before. And these are tabletop mounted daubs, but you can remove the um, optic tube and actually do some quite serious astronomy with these. So if you buy either of these, uh, don't think of them as gimmicks at all. You could utilize the tube later down the road, but you could pop this onto a stable table and you could get some really good views with these. Um, so think about that if you want portability. Just a couple of other options though. What if you're a person that lives in the flat and you want super portability and ruggedness, then here's another recommendation, the Celestron Inspire. It's a 90 millimeter refractor and it's about 200 pound. You'll get excellent views with that. I believe Celestron include all sorts of nice accessories with this telescope as well. Um, and if you've got a bit of money to burn and you're in this situation where you're out in the sticks and you've got loads of land and loads of space, I would be looking just to buy the biggest daub you can buy. So here's the Mead light bridge, 12 inches. You would get stunning views with this but that may well be outside the price range of many people. Now at this point, because um, I know it's difficult to digest all this information, I wanted you to, to point you to the Go Stargazing team's website. They have an excellent guide to telescopes. You'll actually see some of the telescopes I recommended on their website. So please visit their website and check out their recommendations on telescopes. And just a few other um, bits of kit you might consider that I think are essential. So here is a red uh, light torch um, that you need to preserve your um, dark, um, uh, your, your night vision. Remember that white lights will destroy your night vision, so you need a red light in the field ideally. A compass, because you generally need to find north when you're stargazing. Um, that's just one thing you'll you'll come to realize when you start to look for objects. So invest in a decent compass. The f mobile phone ones I tend to find are not that accurate, so it's always good to have a proper compass. A planisphere is really useful. Um, Philips do one. They cost about ten pound from bookstores, and these will show you the constellations that are up all year round. So that's a nice. Um, affordable thing to buy. I also want to recommend two books. Uh, the first one, and I'm plugging my friend Steve Owens here who authored this. 
uh, Stargazing for Dummies. Uh, Steve Owens uh, helped set up the Galloway Dark Sky Park. He's very knowledgeable. He now uh, helps run Glasgow Science Centre. And this is a really good book. And also Left Turn at Orion, a fantastic book. I always go back to this. Um, it comes in a large format. Um, it's got kind of waterproof pages so you can have it out um, in the cold and it's not going to get damaged and it's a great book. And your mobile phone, obviously, if you can avoid um, getting dazzled by the light of the screen, there's loads of good apps on there that you can access. So that's the end of the telescope recommendations. Remember, you can always come back and, and review those again. I know I've probably gone quite quickly through those. So for the final part of the talk, I just want to talk about December sky highlights, things you can see in the night sky. Starting with Mars, now some of you may have seen that bright star, reddish tinged, high in the southeast in the evening, and that is Mars looking absolutely amazing at the moment. Um, a few weeks back, it was actually um, at one of its brightest points in many years. And these are just pictures I took um, with my mobile actually. This is from my back garden. Here's the moon and here's Mars. And again, if you invest in that telescope, you could see views um, similar to this. Uh, now this is maybe a little bit more detailed than what you would see through the eyepiece because it's been post-processed. But you will see dark bands from the uh, Martian um, surface structures and you'll also be able to see some of the polar regions on Mars. So definitely worth having a look at now before Mars gets too far away and dim. What else is up at the moment? Well, Venus in the morning. I've been getting up super early, setting my alarm. Often it's been cloudy, but sometimes I've been rewarded with this dazzling sight, this beacon shining in the mornings. Um, and that's the planet Venus. So bright, the third brightest object in the night sky. Bright because it has a thick white atmosphere of clouds that reflects light back at us and one date for your diaries uh, December the 12th there is a Venus moon conjunction to look out for and you'll be able to see a very thin a uh, waning crescent moon next to Venus and these are always worth looking out for if you look on my site Highland Astronomy on Facebook I always post naked eye views like this that are worth looking out for what else do we have? Jupiter and Saturn setting low towards the southwest. An early evening at the moment. Um, so many people will be missing them because if you wait too long, if you go out at 7 or 8 p.m., Jupiter and Saturn will have set. You need to go out before dinner time, about 5.30, find a vantage point, and you'll see Jupiter is the brightest and Saturn is a little bit dimmer. And as we go through... Um, into December they are moving closer and closer together and on the 21st on the solstice coincidentally there is going to be a great conjunction when Saturn and Jupiter are going to be right on top of each other visually and they're going to be less than a degree apart which will allow you to look through a magnified view in your telescope and see both planets and some of their bright moons together uh, two seconds, there's just a background noise I'm going to sort out. That was just my radiator buzzing in the background there. So look out for that. Also, the International Space Station. Again, uh, the Ghost Stargazing team and myself, we post regular updates on this. Um, ISS, at the moment, is uh, making early evening passes. This is, incidentally, Loch Morlock. Um, in the Cairngorms up here in the Highlands and there's the Milky Way running alongside and I've managed to capture ISS it rising over the hills here's some pictures I've taken over Inverness and one where it's intersecting the Orion constellation and these are going to continue these passes until mid-December uh, so round about the 10th of December, I believe. So please take advantage of them. And it's always fun, I think, if you've got very young children, um, to maybe suggest that these it could be Santa out there testing his sleigh. 
So here's another date to look out for the Geminids meteor shower. And that is going to be on the peak of it is going to be the 13th and the 14th of December. Now, the Gemini radiant is going to be high up all evening and it's a new moon. So this looks like it's going to be a spectacular Geminids this year. Last year and the year before, we were cursed with the moon spoiling the meteor showers somewhat. Now, how do you uh, observe a meteor shower? Well, put your telescope away, put your binoculars away. You don't need them. Get out somewhere dark, um, get a deck chair, a mat for the ground, lie out under the stars, take in as much sky as you can and just chill out and enjoy what you're looking at and be patient and you will hopefully see a spectacular show as you see shooting stars raining down. Now, uh, the Geminids are known to produce up to 100 um, meteors per hour. That's a real overestimate. I generally uh, feel blessed if I you know, can count a, a couple um, within a minute. So uh, the rates are usually lower than that. Um, and I've just got a, an illustration here of what causes a meteor shower, by the way. It's because comets swing by the sun and they leave essentially vapor trails, which the Earth goes through. But occasionally meteor showers erupt into storms. And there was a more recent one in the 60s, but in 1833, one of the most spectacular uh, meteor showers um, occurred on ne November the 13th. And some people called it the night the sky fell in. And this is a illustration of a church minister. He was traveling through Florida at the time. And apparently um, it was incredible. Um, hundreds of thousands of meteors it rained down per hour. And uh, supposedly church attendance shot up after this event. Uh, some people thought it was going to be the end of the world or something. Um, <laughs> Quite amusing, but it just shows you that you never know with the meteor showers, so you have to just get out there and um, see what you can see. And that is kind of the end of my talk. I was going to do a little planetarium tour, but I feel that 45 minutes is probably enough uh, for me to talk. And uh, what I will just uh, single out here, though, is the Orion constellation is a constellation to look for at the moment it's just starting to rise in fact let me very quickly go over to my planetarium software and i'm going to show you a quick sweep of the night sky at the moment so this is actually the time uh, that we're that i'm talking now this is uh, 7 44. so what can we see tonight i have no idea if you've got clear skies where you are um if we look towards the southeast mars is high in the south at the moment it will be very bright if we swing to our left we will see the moon which i believe is one day from full or it could be full today i should have checked that um, it's going to be very bright and dominating the night sky and the moon is currently in taurus this is the bull the horns of the bull taurus here this is aldebaran the red giant star and here are the pleiades star cluster up above an excellent binocular target and down below we have the mighty Orion rising and as we go into December it's going to be even more obvious in our night skies we have Betelgeuse which uh, surprised us all last winter when it began to dim uh, we now know that was dust clouds obscuring it and down here we have Rigel and we have the Orion Nebula in the middle and we also have Gemini over to the left. And very quickly, this is the configuration of the plough with the double star I talked about before. Mysore and Alcar, look out for that. And how do you find Polaris? You take the two right-hand stars of the Dipper and you head up and you get to the North Star Polaris. So anyway, I'm going to end there. Um, thank you very much for listening. Let me quickly go back to my slide deck and I'll just pro progress to the last slide. So there's my details. Please follow along. I have a blog site at moduluniverse.com. My Facebook is Highland Astronomy and I also have an Instagram page. 
please follow me. If you can leave a donation and you've enjoyed the talk, um, I believe Caroline Snow might uh, send the link again. That would really be appreciated to help the cause. And meanwhile, if you have any questions on the feed, I will now start to have a look at those. But thank you very much for listening. So I'm just going to move my laptop forward so I can see. Let me just go back. So I will take some questions. Um, thank you, Graham. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Graham, incidentally, posts some amazing images of the night sky. Great to see you. Um, I'm just catching up here with the feed. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Now, there's about a 10, 15 second delay. So if you want to ask any questions, it might take me a little while to see them appear. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Pauline, Neil. And Neil's just left the link there to the donations. If you can, it's only 250. I don't think we will get all of that. I think Eventbrite and NAB, a portion of it, um, that would be appreciated. What's the best option for beginner's astrophotography? Um, I would suggest, actually, what I showed you earlier, um, which was to buy one of those cheap um, eyepiece adapters that you can mount a mobile phone to. So I would not jump into astrophotography kit immediately. I would test the water with that. And actually, mobile phones can capture incredible images. So... Um, that's one thing to consider very cheap so I would I would go for that um, what's collimation collimation um, is just it's straightening the mirrors so you get a crisp image Saba it's very easy to do it doesn't take a lot of practice and mostly you don't even need to collimate it's only if you maybe bump the telescope so Sarah 11 year old enjoyed it much thank you going to invest in a telescope clubs or meetings we can come to her and Avi more. Uh, well, with coronavirus, it's very difficult, Sarah. Um, obviously, most things are online. Um, there's the Highlands Astronomical Society. Um, they run regular events, although they're online at the moment as well. Um, so unfortunately, at the moment, it's probably all online. Um, best place to purchase a scope, John. Hi, John. Uh, that's actually a tricky at the moment. Apparently, there is a big shortage of telescopes. Um, obviously lockdown has encouraged people to take up the hobby um, however that's not going to be the same with binoculars so um, first light optics are a good online um, place um, I'm not so sure about local shops um, actually the, the go stargazing link might give you some help with that uh, Joe, best videos to watch on how to use the wrong telescope that you've already bought <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't know about that. Uh, this is process This is what happens when people buy uh, equatorial mounts, Joe. I'm not sure if that's the same with you. Um, but yes, I would just tour YouTube personally. Um, any mounts you'd recommend for the Celestron Skymasters? Uh, so um, I would go for the Dobsonian mount, if that's what you're talking about. Um, if you're starting out, Anne, uh, always buy a Dob to begin with. Um, and then once you get a little bit more proficient, you can go up to uh, an equatorial mount. And the Olympus 10 by 50s I just buy a cheap pair of um, camera tri uh, um, tripods. Uh, they're, th because they're so light, you don't need heavy mounting for them. Off to buy a Celestron now, Mark Grade. We'll get out to Loch Ness. Absolutely, Nikki. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Paul. You started with an equatorial. I'm an engineer. Well, at least you got there. So you had a baptism of fire, Paul, I guess. So, yeah. 
a portable tracker you would recommend is that i'm not so sure if you mean for astrophotography ian or if you're talking about um a robotic mount the select the um the casa grain telescope i use um is uh, driven with a motor and you can get quite cheap motors on Dobbs as well but otherwise I'm not so sure on that I'm not a, 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 a real expert astrophotographer I have to admit a Mary complete beginner thank you hoping to get one that would be great to see you at a break in Mary I have 20 by 50 pair of binoculars. Yep, those are good. Quite high magnification, Mark, which means you might get more shake, shaky views with those. Um, so you might want to consider um, a camera mount with them. But you will get you know, very good views of the moon. Uh, you'll see some double stars. You'll see some galaxies and clusters. So there's lots you can access. Are there mobile phone binocular adapters for it? Yes, absolutely. Um, Usman, the one I showed you earlier will work with that. I will try to post a link when this gets um, deposited onto Facebook for the adapter. Is the Dob 8 inch Skyline easy to use, Pauline? Yes, it is. And no, you do not need to align it, Pauline. You don't need to find Polaris. It's really easy to use. You can just start pointing and observing. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Neil, for posting the link to that. Yeah, Joe, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, but stick with it. Um, keep it because you'll find it useful later on. Um, a mount for the Celestron binoculars, and Yeah, again, um, do you mean the bigger ones? The 20 by... Ah, okay. Now, I we had to spend about uh, 200... I think £200 pound on the, um, the mount for those. You need a really heavy-duty mount for those 100 by 25s. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, if you send me a message separately, I'll try to find them. Okay. What's the Dobsonian? What's the difference between a Dob and an alt azimuth mount, John? Not much difference, John. You just go left, right, up and down. They're basically the same. The Dobsonian is a little bit more stable um and robust i would argue uh especially if you're on a budget you'll get better bang for your buck with the dobsonian any suggestions for a finder scope yes most of the telescopes i've showed you will come with a star finder um um but, but you might want to upgrade to a magnified finder scope uh, i think orion um do a good one i can't remember the name of it unfortunately um but go for that um and hi from the black isle brilliant uh, got, coming to an event soon in aberdeenshire now great hope you've got some clear skies on yep and there's a d d uh, adapter that neil has sent a link to thank you very much yep and go ahead with the message and well, I think that seems to be the end of the questions. Um, so maybe we should bring the um, session to a close. What do you think, Caroline and Neil? Oh, here we go. I've got another question, actually. Can you remove the tray from an EQ2 mount so that it is more transportable? Uh, okay, I see what you're saying. Uh, it depends on the scope, Jenny. Um, sometimes it does. So my... Um, 8 inch Cassegrain has a tray and it does offer stability. All I would say is you might be able to do something DIY with that uh, to make it more stable. And Graham's Black Owl Boy as well. I didn't know that, Graham. Uh, we've been loving all your pictures from Aberdeen though. Any local cubs for, clubs for kids? Um, well, again, Sarah, uh, once we get beyond this pandemic and it's safe, uh, you can certainly come along to the events here or at Abreakin, or there's also the Highlands Astronomical Society might consider. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Okay, so <laughs> we'll just end it there. Thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure, and I'll just close the feed now. Thank you very much.